At 6am, a shift changeover was undertaken. An operator just starting noticed excessive heat in the pilot operated valve and holding tanks and operated the backup block valve. Two and a half hours after the initial condensate pump trip, the faulty pilot valve had been bypassed. By this time, around 120,000 litres of coolant from the primary loop had escaped. However, the discovery of this faulty valve did not end the incident. At 6.57 a.m., a site area emergency was called after contaminated water was recorded at 300 times the expected level. Contaminated water managed to escape the reactor containment building by flowing into the sump and was pumped into a waste storage tank in the auxiliary building, which then overflowed onto the floor and the heating and ventilation system managed to vent radioactive gases into the atmosphere. However, initially this was at a low rate. As more water flowed into the auxiliary building, the radioactivity rate increased. At 7.24am, manager Gary Miller announced a general emergency. Plant owner Metropolitan Edison informed the Pennsylvania State Emergency Management Agency about the situation, who then informed state and local authorities. During the next hour and a quarter, radioactivity levels on the site varied from 3 to 9 millirems per hour. Radiation monitors off-site at the time of the declaration of the general emergency were only showing less than 1 millirem per hour. However, as time went on, this number would rise. Metropolitan Edison made multiple contradictory statements about radioactivity released to the government authorities, as staff at TMI2 were still in a state of confusion whilst they struggled to manage stable cooling for the reactor core. Throughout the morning, the operators tried to force water into the core to condense the steam that had built up. However, the attempts failed. It was then attempted to establish heat removal by pressurising the primary cooling system. However, again, this didn't achieve the desired effect. Over the next few hours, the operators attempt to pressurise the system to allow flooding. In doing so, some hydrogen was vented. However, the pressure in the reactor vessel remained too high. During this period of around two hours, no effective method was in place for heat removal and the core reached temperatures of up to 2,500 Fahrenheit. By 7pm, a sustained effort to repressurize the coolant yielded some results. Forced cooling was restored when one pump was able to operate, which in turn allowed heat removal via a steam generator. Heat in the core began to fall, however a large part had melted and was seriously radioactive. There was another worry on the horizon in the form of a potential explosion. To try and relieve the pressure, the block valve was opened periodically, releasing hydrogen from the system to the reactor containment building. Eventually, enough hydrogen was present to support ignition. Instruments within the reactor building recorded a dramatic increase of pressure at 25 psi, hinting of a hydrogen burn. Luckily, this was well within the reactor building's capacity. After the core had been uncovered during the events of the morning of the 28th, hydrogen had been produced and was discovered in the form of a bubble in the reactor vessel, leading to fears of a hydrogen explosion from the NRC. Unlike the burn in the building, the explosion inside the reactor vessel could be devastating, releasing radiation into the atmosphere. These fears did not come to fruition as there was not enough oxygen present inside the vessel to support combustion. The operators managed to dissipate the hydrogen via the pumping of coolant water over the next few days. 28 hours after the initial turbine trip, William Scranton III, the Lieutenant Governor, announced at a news briefing that the owners of the Three Mile Island had assured him that everything is under control. Unsurprisingly though, later this statement was changed to, the situation is more complex than the company first led us to believe. As a precaution, the schools were closed and residents were advised to stay indoors. On the advice from the NRC, Pennsylvania Governor, Dick Formber advised voluntary evacuation of all pregnant women and children under the age of five within five miles of the plant. By Friday the 30th, the area was extended to 20 miles. In total, around 140,000 people had evacuated, however most would return within three weeks. Within three weeks of the accident, heat within the reactor core had decayed enough to allow coolant pumps to be switched off, allowing coolant to be carried by natural circulation. Eventually the reactor would be powered down to 0.2 megawatts or 0.007 of its rated power. During the course of the accident, 93 petabecuels of radioactive noble gases and 560 gigabecuels of radiodyne were released, averaging around 1 millirem per resident living near the plant. 
In comparison, a chest x-ray yields 3.2 millirems, around twice that of the Three Mile Island. In total, 480 petabecuels of radioactive noble gases were released into the atmosphere. However, most of these gases had a relatively short half-life. The TMI-2 was beyond repair, and whilst investigations were undertaken, TMI-1 remained out of service. Cleanup efforts started in August and oh boy there was a big job ahead, involving around 1,000 workers. The nearly brand new TMI-2 containment building was unsafe to walk in. All the contaminated water that had spilled in both the reactor and auxiliary rooms had to be cleaned up. However, it wasn't until July 1980 that the first manned entry into the reactor building took place. Some of this water had seeped into the building's concrete, making it almost impossible to remove. All surfaces had to be decontaminated before any major defueling work could be carried out. In the first months, low-level contaminated items were sent to Richland, Washington, and works to completely sever Unit 2 from Unit 1 began. In July 1984, the reactor head was removed to prepare for fuel removal and for investigation into the actual state of the core. It wasn't until 1985 that the first fuel began to be removed and throughout the reactor core had to be kept underwater. Workers used long handled tools to remove fuel by lifting it into canisters. All of this was done from a platform above the reactor. 343 canisters full of fuel was removed by the end of the cleanup works and was shipped off to Idaho National Laboratory. Eventually all the fuel was dry stored inside concrete containers. In total 100 tonnes was removed from the reactor leaving 1% of fuel and debris inside the vessel. Talking about the water, the cleanup efforts yielded over 10.6 megalitres of contaminated water, which was treated and safely evaporated. In 1990, the main phase of the cleanup had been completed when the last of the radioactive waste was shipped off to Idaho. And in 1991, the last of the contaminated water was pumped from the reactor. Finally, in 1993, the cleanup had officially ended However, the contaminated concrete in TMI-2's building was left for when TMI-1 was decommissioned. TMI-1 would not restart until October 1985 and would go on to have a safe and successful career. In 1997, TMI-1 completed the longest operating run of any light water reactor in nuclear history, 616 days and 23 hours. In all, TMI-1 became one of the most successful power reactors in terms of safety and reliability, being shut down in September 2019, after generating 240 billion kilowatt hours in its 40-year career. In the six years it was shut down, modifications were made to the reactor and procedures, incorporating lessons learned from the TMI-2 accident, which leads us quite nicely into the investigation. In April 1979, President Jimmy Carter commissioned an investigation into the accident at TMI-2, consisting of a panel of 12 people picked for their neutral stance on nuclear energy, headed by John G. Kemeny, the president of Dartmouth College. The completed study was released in October 1978, after six months of hearing depositions and document analysis. The commission didn't put blame for the accident solely at the door of operator error. Instead, the finger was pointed at the training and rules and procedures in place for the operators. Criticism was laid on B&W, NRC and MET-ED for poor maintenance, poor quality assurances, lack of operator training, failure to communicate vital safety notices and inadequate management. Little thought was given to the human machine interface during the design of the control rooms at Three Mile Island. As within minutes of the turbine trip, over 100 alarms were sounded, leading to operator overload. Many of these alarms were unimportant, however no way of suppressing them was provided to the operators, leading to unnecessary confusion. The report stated that an accident such as the one at TMI-2 was inevitable, due to the design of the control room leading up to misinterpretation of indications given by equipment. It was found that the particular failed valve had succumbed to similar issues on 11 previous occasions. Insanely, an almost identical incident unfolded around 18 months before at Davis Bessie Nuclear Power Station. However, luckily the stuck valve was identified after 20 minutes instead of the TMI-2's 80 minutes. B&W had failed to notify its customers of the potentially deadly fault. This with the poor interface in the control room and poor training of operators meant that an accident like this was inevitable. Due to the President's Commission being released only six months after the accident, 
proper evaluation to the damage of the core couldn't be included. This would come after the opening of the core vessel in 1984. Investigations into the core including inserting of a television camera in 1985 revealed at least 45% or 62 tonnes of the core had melted and 19 tonnes had made its way into the lower part of the reactor vessel without any serious damage to the vessel itself. Most of the melted core material remained inside the core region and after samples were taken in 1988 it was confirmed that the damage was not as bad as had originally been thought. Although the Three Mile Island accident didn't kill anyone directly, it did become one of the nails in the coffin of the US nuclear energy boom. And post-accident, the reactor owner Metropolitan Edison had a few fines and compensation bills to pay, with a $25 million class action settlement and an estimated $82 million paid out for loss of business revenue, evacuation expenses and health claims. After TMI2, many BNW reactors were cancelled with 51 reactor projects of varying manufacture being cancelled between 1980 and 1984. Much of the cancellations were due to increased construction costs and more stringent safety guidelines. However, 1986 was more of a blow with a somewhat well-known nuclear accident. But the Three Mile Island, at least for the USA, was the fuel needed to keep the anti-nuclear lobby going. With the largest demonstration in NYC's Madison Square Gardens, in September 1979, having a turnout of around 200,000 people. The accident, although gone down in the annals of history in infamy, did see a change in working practices, which improved the safety and reliability of world nuclear power as a whole, as seen with the successful career of TMI-1. However, as that reactor begins to be decommissioned, the public will probably forget the safe production of power it created in its 40-year life, in lieu of its more radioactive sibling. But hey, disaster is always more interesting than success, hence why you have probably watched this video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Did you know I've got a Teespring store? Check it out if you fancy some plainly difficult merch. If you want to support the channel financially, I have a Patreon and you can get early access to videos from just $1 per creation. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.